All right, well, um, we're in chapter 15 tonight. As we had noted, we finished up uh, last week when we had the crossing over the Red Sea and uh, just a lot of things that we can look there as we, we start to draw some parallels. Because remember, the Lord had told us that all these things were, were written beforehand. These things were written beforehand, uh, certainly for our edification, for our understanding, and they foreshadow a lot of things for us, especially... When we look at the person of Jesus Christ, there's so many pictures of Christ throughout the Old Testament. Uh, we see it time and time again. We see uh, with that of the great redemption God has here for Israel when he parted the Red Sea. We see it later when there would be a, a, a plague of snakes that, would, uh, that God would send into the midst of the camp of Israel. And, and Moses would uh, be instructed to make that, uh, that post, the pole with the with the snake world around it and everyone that would come and see that post that they would view it that they would be saved from the snake bite and Christ would take that later and say just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so so must the son of man also be lifted up as those people were saved then through that of looking at what Moses had, uh, had made by God's instruction now we look at the cross of Jesus Christ and there we find our, our true healing uh, we find all that we need in the in the person of Christ. So tonight, uh, is we are we've moved across the sea now. We've hit we've hit the other shore, and now the the people of God, Israel, they're singing the song of redemption, and it's commonly called Moses' song, is uh, the song of Moses. But understanding that uh, the Bible teaches us in that first verse that not only did Moses he wasn't doing just a, a solo performance. But it said that the children of Israel, that they also sang that song. So we're going to read verses 1 through 19. And if we could probably read maybe three verses apiece, go right around the room, that would be great. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father, God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Go ahead, John. Pharaoh's, um, let's see. Uh, Verse 4. For Pharaoh's chariots and his host have he cast into the sea. His chosen captives also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them, and they sank into the bottom as a stone. And thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemies. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as an heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. He blew with pure wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You, in your mercy, have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. The people will hear and be afraid. Saul will take hold of the inhabitants of Galicia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling like, will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Cain will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as still as a stone. Your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over, whom you have purchased. You will 
bring them in and plant them in the mount of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariot and his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought back the borders of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. There you go. Very good. So as we noted, this is what we uh, we would call um, the song of Moses, Moses' song. But even though as we read again in verse 1, that uh, all the children of Israel sang it. Uh, but bringing up to where we left off, that the Pharaoh's army at this point has been destroyed. This is uh, following that of the destruction. Now we've got in verse 19 where it says for the horses of pharaoh went with his chariots and horsemen into the sea and the lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them but the children of israel went uh on dry land in the midst of the sea uh just summarizing what had already occurred but we understand that as they these people sang this song following that of the destruction of pharaoh's uh army uh the people here when they reach the other side and pharaoh's army is destroyed uh, the people here pause and they sing a song of deliverance to the Lord, a song of thanksgiving, a song of deliverance. They are looking at what has just transpired within, I don't want to say moments, but over the course of this journey and now this culmination of the destruction of what was already had happened in, in Egypt. And they sing this song uh, of deliverance to the Lord, as we noted in, verse, in the first half of verse 1. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying. Uh, so we are going to break this down tonight into several different parts. Uh, sometimes it's easier to do that for us to, to because we, as we read, uh, it's easier for us to break it down in different parts to get a better understanding of what actually they are trying to say. Uh, we can clump it all together and, and, and read it as, as, we, as we have. But you see that there are segments that they've broken this up into. Just like, and it's, again, it's poetry. It's exactly what it is. And it's broken into these segments. So there are several that I have here. The first one is going to be the, the reason for the song. Right from the beginning in verses, uh, verse, half of verse 1 and verse 2, it's the, the reason they are singing. Uh, very concise, here is the reason for the song. This is why we are singing. The second part would be a description of what has already transpired in verses 3 through 5. So they'll, they'll give basically a synopsis of what has already happened. Uh, not going all the way back to when they were in Egypt and we have the ten plagues there, but just this particular incident here at the shores of the Red Sea. The next part, the third part, would, uh, they would speak about how God's power is displayed. How God himself would display his power in his victory over the Egyptians on the Israelites' uh, behalf. And that's verses 6 through 8. The fourth part, uh, very short, verse 9, is the, they, they move from that of God's uh, mighty power against the Egyptians. And they speak about the enemy's desire for them, what the Egyptians look to do the, to them. Um, then in the fifth part, uh, it's we move and we speak about what God has accomplished. It kind of would be like, well, these two kind of play together uh, as far as verses 6 through 8 and, and verses uh, 10 through 13 here. Uh, but this speaks more in, in length about the, the power of God compared to what this does where it speaks about what he actually accomplished by his power. Uh, verse or the next, the sixth part is going to be those ongoing effects, verses 14 and 16. These things that would be uh, continue on afterwards. That even though, yes, God has destroyed the Egyptians there in the Red Sea, there will be some things that will carry on afterwards that we see. Uh, and this is really, and some would argue that this may have been written later, uh, but I have no reason to believe that. Uh, but it's almost a prophetic word from the Lord for, through Moses and these people that, yes, these individuals are destroyed, the Egyptians are, but there's a host of other nations that will be, uh, some will come against you, but I will put fear upon them because of this particular incident, this Red Sea incident. And then the seventh thing, will, the seventh thing is the, just the final results of it all. 
when they look to the Lord ultimately and look what God is going to be doing futuristically. Again, what he will do to these other nations and the ongoing effects and also what God himself will establish with that of the nation of Israel. So when I said I bought a bunch of slides to start with tonight, that's what I meant. So we're, we're just going to try to move through them as best as we, we can, these seven parts. The first one, again, is going to be the reason for the song. So as noted, just as the, the Bible teaches us here, he says, they say, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Uh, the word there, and it's, it's really interesting as I was studying this, and I didn't have a whole lot because I had so much to really put these other little pieces in here. But it's interesting when we see what is actually going on with the sea itself, the waters caving in on that of the Egyptians, how many uh, words within Hebrew uh, go back to this of, of waves, of water, of the, the deep. Um, and this is one of them. When we speak about this being a, a triumph gloriously, the whole thing means they're being risen up, that God himself risen up like the waves of the sea, and God himself, had, had, he rose up on behalf of Israel, and he triumphed gloriously over that of the Egyptians. We see something else when we talk about the, the reason, because again, God has triumphed. And remember, that's, that's important for us, like we had talked about Sunday morning when we went in uh, Romans chapter 3 and spoke about what do we have to boast in? What is our boast in? Can I boast in how uh, good I am or how righteous I am? Paul said, where is that boasting? And we have no boasting at all except in the cross of Jesus Christ because we know that our salvation comes from the grace of God. And as they have noted, try God himself, you have triumphed gloriously. And when we look today, their boast is in the Lord that this is God's work, this is God's fight, this was God's battle, this is God's victory. And same it is for us. As the Apostle Paul would note when we speak about the victory of which we sing about uh, the old song, Victory in Jesus, we note that if I have anything to boast about, as Paul said, it'll be in the cross of Jesus Christ. And these people, again, when we speak about the Israelites, uh, they're looking to God and continue with uh, these particulars when we talk about uh, God showing uh, who they're praising and honoring, and it says, the Lord is my. So, and what is God for these people? So when they're looking at the Lord and they're, they're saying, God is this for me, Yah the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, they're saying, this is what God is to me. And, and I think that's good for us too when we talk about our times of worship with the Lord, when we're singing songs, when we're, uh, you know, and sometimes we sing songs so many times, we just kind of just breeze over them and, and really not give them a, a lot of thought, but we should. Uh, we should be giving some thought to the songs we sing, even though we may have them memorized, but letting that impact our lives and remembering just as, as these folks here, they're acknowledging God is what? God is my, first they say, my strength. God is my strength, and certainly he is. And he says that God is my song, that God is my song, he's my salvation, God, the Lord is my God. Yahweh is my God. He is my Elohim. And not only that, but they close with saying, He is my Father's God. So this God of which my fathers had worshipped, this God has become my own God now, the one that they testified to. Because remember, the Hebrew writer would go back and he would say about our heritage as Christians, going back to people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then he would deal with uh, people... Uh, such as David and, and Moses and, and others that he would deal with there in chapter 11. And then in chapter 12, he says, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of what? Witnesses. witnesses. Yeah, witnesses. And, and for that, I, you, we, for, for some of us, which we should, there should be people, maybe not family, uh, but there should be people in our lives that we, we look back to and they were instrumental in leading us to the Lord. Maybe, uh, maybe a teacher, a Sunday school teacher, maybe a pastor, maybe your best friend or somebody you met in college or one of those things, or maybe a grandmom or dad or whoever, a mother. But it's noted that they, they are praising God's triumph for them 
they're praising God and they're saying this God is, is basically here everything to them. Because remember, going back to what we talked about last week, they were in a hopeless situation. They, as, as we said, the proverbial rock in a hard place. They had their backs to the sea or however they were positioned, however you want to look at it, but one way or the other, backs to the sea and, and the army in front of them or switch it around. But same way, no escape for them. Uh, they were in trouble. And, and here, recognizing that apart from Jesus Christ, we're in trouble too. Uh, that there, there's no escape and, and we're helpless and hopeless. And when we come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, we find out also that Christ is, is all in all, that he's my everything. And that's again, when these people are, are singing, that's what we see. And not as, ex as exhausted, but these particulars that they're using, my strength, my song, my salvation, my God, my Father's God. This is who this is. Yes? I, I watched this last week and then I was sharing then what you're saying. And <laughs> what's going through my mind is, is just hours before or maybe days before, they were all ready to go back to Egypt. Yeah. I mean, they were just saying, let's give up, let's go back and what have you. That's and right. now, in a matter of time, Small amount of time. They see, my goodness, what yeah. God has done for us. And it just amazes me sometimes how fickle we are. Yeah, that's right. That's that we, we have to have proof all oh, the time. It seems like it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and noted, uh, and that's something that we'll see when we talk about the history of Israel during this journey. Oh. That is something we'll see consistently. Mm -hmm. It's up and down, up and down. So uh, again, noted this, this, this is who I'm praising. You are all these things to, to me. And with that, that since God is our strength, our song, our salvation, my God, uh, my Father's God, uh, the, it says that I will, I will praise, I will exalt. There in verse 2, the Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise him my father's God, and I will exalt him, praising and exalting Christ. And uh, for them, God, who they knew, Jehovah, they, they knew him, and they, they watched how powerful he has worked on their behalf. And knowing these things, and they've applied these uh, particulars to themselves, and now they're saying, since he is this, I will do this. I will praise and exalt his name. I will basically, what we would say in a word, we would worship. We will worship God. We'll honor him because I know what he has done for me. Uh, and these people literally, when you speak about uh, a mighty work of God, uh, viewed that uh, in those moments. And then they cross over and, and they watch this army destroyed before their eyes. And then they just exalt and praise the Lord for what he's, what he's done. So uh, the next uh, thing when we talk, uh, when we jump to the second part, it, it gives us a description of what has actually uh, transpired uh, in in the in those when we talk about these few hours or or moments or whatever the case uh, is. Uh, God, as we see in verse three, and and we you could move this around a little bit in, in the first couple of verses, but I, I chose just to shift it down into, into verse three because of what was going on. The Lord here, God, is shown as a warrior. God is shown as a, a warrior God. And, and one thing that I was giving thought to, putting this lesson together, is that uh, we, and you've heard me say before, and, and we know it, that we've got people in the world to say that God has changed. God is, is different than he was in the Old Testament now. God has took on a whole new... Uh, he took on a whole bunch of different attributes. And, and one of those things that people would say when we talk about this, here God is shown as a warrior. He is a God of war. And that was him back then. But see, he's different now. Uh, but we, we have to beg to differ because the Bible doesn't teach us that. To start with, we know that God never changes to start with. He, he's always the same. He was the, the same God he's always been and will forever be. And then noted, if we look at Revelation chapter 19, uh, which makes it very clear for us, if people 
would say, well, you know, God's changed. Well, has he, has he really? Is, is God still going to be one who will defeat his enemies on behalf of his people? Is he still going to be the sovereign Lord of all, the judge of all the earth? Well, the Bible says there in, in Revelation 19, it says, uh, verse 11, he says, Now when I saw, and, and John the Revelator, as we would call him, is, he's having this unfold before him. He says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. All right? So here's this one on this white horse. Now at this point, just in this reading, if we don't read further, we may not really know who this is. This could be, uh, as far as our reading now, it could be anybody. It could be some human being coming, but we don't see that, do we? Uh, we see that he's called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in the blood, and his name is called what? The Word of God. Now, who would, who would we, at this point, we should have, even if we were kind of, uh, you know, superficial Bible students, we should kind of have an idea that this is just not some normal human being, that this is just not someone that God is foretelling like a, a Nebuchadnezzar or some human king that's going to rise up. This is somebody else. This is somebody more powerful than we've ever seen before. So if we've got, if we're even superficial Bible students, who does the Word of God reference? When it says his name is called the Word of God. Uh, Jesus, of course, of course it does. And where do we, where do we find that? It's not a trick question. I don't, I'm not playing trick questions. Uh, where, where can we find that? Where, where can we go back and... and John, sure, we can go back to the Gospel of John, and we can find that very right in the very first verses. Right in the beginning was the Word, and the Word and the Word was God. We we see that as we start to make these connections, it says, "And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine uh, linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule with a rod of iron." He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So it leads us to, to a point that we understand that knowing this is Jesus Christ, God himself, he has come triumphantly back to earth, and he is looking as he did on behalf of Israel here. He and the person of Jesus Christ will triumphantly come again. And he will defeat, and just as noted there in that uh, 15th verse, uh, he will rule them with a rod of iron, treads out the winepress of the fierceness of his wrath of Almighty God. And he is, as we would read and understand, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I guess that's an inspiration for the Hallelujah Chorus. Uh, yes, when we talk about the Hallelujah Chorus, it comes, uh, parts of that come from this. We speak uh, along those lines. Yep, everybody stands. Um, as the king did back then. Uh, again, a description of what has transpired. They're speaking about what God is for them. They're going to sing this song. They thank God as he's their salvation, all this. I will praise him. I will exalt him. God is this warrior God. He has fought this enemy for me, and he has decimated, at this point, he's completely decimated, destroyed Pharaoh's army. Uh, they had come and swept down into the sea, and the waters had collapsed all around them. And it was noted, uh, jump back to Exodus, if you would. It was noted also that he says, Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains, uh, the, these more elite group, these were people, these were some of the best of the very best that he had carried with him to bring, to slaughter who he wanted of Israel and then bring the rest of them back captive. So even these chosen ones that Pharaoh had, as he says here, as he decimates God's army, but it was also along with the regular infantry and what he had, the, the horsemen and chariot, charioteers, uh, he also defeats that of, of Pharaoh's very best, what Pharaoh had to throw at him. I think the, um, okay, this destruction that went on in Egypt with the Pharaoh's army in the sea, and then the destruction that's gonna go on in Revelation, mm -hmm. is there any other destruction in the middle 
that God did like that? That he destroyed everything? Uh, well, uh, well, we, we know that as we... But he's rescuing the Jews there, and he's yeah. going to rescue the Jews in Revelation. And there, there are times that we, we see that when we speak of what he would eventually do with Israel, because he said if you will, as we know, as far as it being a, a conditional covenant, he said if you follow me, I'll bless you. If you don't, I'll curse you. It's just, that's the basics of it. Uh, so what we do see is Israel would leave the Lord, uh, that there would be destruction of Jerusalem. There would be the, uh, as, as we all know, and you know very well, uh, that there would be the uh, the captivity uh, that they they would just basically just leave the poorest of the poor around Jerusalem in the area, and then they would carry everybody else off, and they would relocate them in certain areas within the Babylonian Empire. Um, but the two rescuing times have only that I'm thinking of. He rescued them from Pharaoh yeah. to start the nation, mm -hmm. and now in Revelation he's going to rescue them again. Yeah, in a major sense. In a major, in a, in a major, major sense. sense. We would see that he, that the Lord himself in these, uh, in, I don't want to say minor ways, is it, but, but when we talk about those big pieces that we see like this, and then we see when Christ would return, um, but we also see the Lord when they would, uh, when Joshua would carry uh, the group over the Jordan River and they would defeat Jericho. You've got some other of those things that may not be as, is highlighted, uh, you know, we know them, but they're not as highlighted as things like this, but we've got these other instances where the Lord himself would, would do that. Um, so, is, uh, and it speaks about what the Lord had uh, actually um, worked his power when he did to these people. Uh, he cast, sunk, covered, he, and then in the one part where we speak about down, he said they sank to the, to the bottom like a stone. Uh, they he just he, they went down. Uh, these are the things, the words that they use to describe exactly what the Lord Himself did to Pharaoh's army. Uh, and it ends up being one thing: he he completely eliminated them or destroyed them. The next thing that we note is God's power being on display, and so we see what the the Lord had had, had done, as far as what had transpired, what those individuals were able to see and how they viewed it, this casting, this, uh, this sinking, this covering. The, the, they just sank like a, a, a lead weight. They went down. Uh, but now we speak about the, the God's power. It shifts. And again, these two can kind of um, move together a little bit, but I, I just broke them up. Go ahead. I just have a question. I mean, it's in the section before in verse 2. I just want to know how it's translated translation the word habitation in, in the 16th century English doesn't translate you know uh, I go prepare a habitation it how was it translated in other, other other Bibles and where which where in verse you, two verse two read verse it for two, me he says over there I will prepare him an habitation um how was it was in uh, is that it um I understand because yeah, I read across that because that's one word uh, I, because he is he is my God and and it, here I will praise him and the things that I read and I think this is what you this, this discussed what I, before and and years. that is the only place uh, that, that Hebrew word is used right. and everything that that I read and there were several things that I went back to with the uh, the looking at some of the Greek and Hebrew lexicons. And, and they, there is still within some of these scholars uh, right. that trying to, out trying to figure out because now one, one commentator, what I, I do remember, because it was used in, in another, not in the Bible, but in other, uh, I guess, Hebrew writings, it was used as a, a way of exaltation or praise or honor, something along, along that line. I mean, the word literally means to beautify. Him, yeah. To beautify him. And so, and, and that's basically the only way you can really figure out what it means is someone that knows semantic languages and takes that word out of the Bible into 
usage of that word <coughs> in other Semitic languages to get an, a, a flavor. Right. Um, there, you know, like uh, in the Greek, there's like the vocabulary of the of the New Testament and, and other other uh, documents, and there you get a flavor of Greek words yeah. uh, used out of the Bible, so you get a picture of what the word means, a word picture. But since you don't have that, um, he only used once. But there's no no point of reference. Yeah, and biblically, every, no. Every uh, person that I have spoken to since seminary has blown me off, you know, because they don't have an answer for it, too. My professor told me, my Hebrew professor, look what other translations have done. Uh, I've been accused as a one guy in the one seminary he said, he accused me of being a research slave for him. <laughs> Just because all I want to know is what the Word of God says, and they've already spent all the time studying well, just tell me. I mean, I've already done the theological word book. I've already taken yeah. it out as far as it can possibly go, and I don't really have an answer other than the concept of beautify him, you know, to praise him. Yeah, and that seems like it is all I read. And they were still, and, and not that there was a great division to say it was like holiness and then wickedness. It, it wasn't that way, but but there's still in division about really what the word itself was supposed to. And we also have to understand that this is also literature. It's a song. Yeah. It's not a theological statement of directness from God to Moses saying something. And so a lot of the verbs here are not in the PL, but the uh, if PL, uh, both in, in terms of uh, the verbiage and uh, in those verbs. And so it's kind of like a hyper extended emotional response mm -hmm. of what the basic word would be. Right. And that's what literature generally does, the FPL uh, in terms of uh, those verbs. So I never, I'll have to wait till I go to heaven until I find yeah. some scholar that is really wants to understand you, the word of God and really wants to dig into it. But most of what I find out in, in terms of, sad to say, in academia, they just blow you off because they're not interested in uh, really studying the word of God. Yeah. They just want their classes. Everything that I read, it, it was still, it got, one would say this, this, but then they, even if they would lean one way, they would still say there's division. There's division. So uh, then the song is we're moving on. In verse six, he says, "Your right hand has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy to pieces." And speaking about as as we would note when we talk about God's right hand, it's always been symbolic of God's absolute power. That God, again, we speak about absolute, some things that we stray away from. When we speak about the power of God, it is absolute, and this is symbolic of God's absolute power. That God himself, when it speaks about your right hand, that's how they viewed it. Not that they literally seen uh, the right hand of God coming down on the Egyptians or anything along that line, but they understood the absolute power of God, and especially now when they watch one of the greatest armies on the earth at that time, one of the greatest, uh, just completely uh, destroyed in their sight. The next is uh, one when it speaks along the lines, your, your right hand oh, has become glorious in power, your right hand dash the enemy pieces, and in the greatness of your excellence, in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. The greatness of your excellence. Uh, the word here, when we start talking along the line, the greatness of your excellence, majesty, splendor, glory, and this was another one of those words that... Uh, come about with this idea of the sea, the surging of waves. And I got that in my, my mind when you talk about how, how beautiful uh, you, can, you can go down to the shore and you can just watch the waves roll in and, and how it can at times bring a, a peace and a tranquility uh, to our souls. Uh, but then we can find how destructive that power can be when those waves well up into something we would call a tidal wave or tsunami and how awesomely, awesomely powerful that can be. And that's the kind of picture that I have when we speak about uh, God himself is, is we know God is a, is a great God, an awesome God, 
uh, worshiping the Lord, as the psalmist said, and the, and, the, and the beauty of holiness, knowing that there is no one like God as pure and righteous as he is, but also knowing that it's, it's not something of which when we look at like a flower and how beautiful that is and, and, and delicate uh, it looks, it's, it, it may be itself beautiful and good to look at, but it's very frail. God himself would be someone who certainly is, is beautiful to behold uh, in his majesty and holiness and righteousness, but he's not fragile. He's not fragile at all. He's, he's in absolute power, absolute control uh, all the time. So when, when the, when the uh, and you, you'll see this over and over again uh, when we talk about the anthropomorphisms, uh, these things, as, as the Bible says, no one has ever seen God at any time. Uh, but we have, what we start to do is we start to put these, uh, these human features to the divine. Hands, eyes, remember, nostrils, breath, all these things to describe what we understand is the power of God, who God is, this great deliverance with his righteous right arm, all these things. And that is when we express uh, these human attributes onto some, someone divine, such as God. So when we speak along the lines, the greatness, uh, or excuse me, the, uh, his right hand, right arm, breath of his nostrils, all these kinds of words, just a big word. It's not, that's again, not one of those words that if I'm down Gordon's that I'm gonna hear every day. Uh, you just, you just not. If, if somebody would bring that word up, I would certainly raise up my head and say, who is this that is dark in the doors of the cultural center? Now, then we have one verse, one verse in verse nine that gives uh, a description of what the desire of the enemy, the Egyptians, were for Israel. Uh, verse 9, it says, The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. That was the desire of the enemy. They wanted them to do basically decimate them. And with that, uh, as we, we see, and there's some irony that we get engaged in here for a moment. Uh, but I will do this. I will do that. My desire is, is this is, I will pull my sword and, and destroy them. Uh, we would note that as we bring it up, that that is what we said. That's the desire of our enemy as well. Uh, when we talk about the enemy of all mankind, uh, Satan and his demonic forces that they also were looking to just destroy the human soul to ravage it um, again people can be under uh, satanic um, oppression or sat satanic control and be very well off in this world because Satan knows as well as all of us in here know tonight that this world is drawing to an end that there is going to come a time when all that we know will, will be wiped away. And Satan, the Bible says, he knows his time is short. But one thing that will last is going to be it's the eternality of the soul. And looking for Satan to carry as many as he can with him. So just as the Egyptians were looking to destroy Israel, Satan looks to destroy the souls of mankind. And he may give us in this life all that we ever want. He may give us all the power and prestige and wealth. He may give us plenty. Uh, but what is the end result? Jesus said, he said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And what? Loses his soul. Loses his soul. And, and that's the thing. And that's, again, when we speak about the enemy, the enemy's desire for us, he can give us what we want now. Uh, but what is the end result? What is the end result? Now here, when we talk about in the, in the mouth of the Egyptians, it has a, a poetic irony when applied to Israel because this is what they were looking to do to Israel. They were looking to utterly destroy them, pursue, overtake, divide, the spoil. And actually what happened is what we do see is Israel was by, again, the power of God that God did that on their behalf. The enemy wanted to do it to them, but God turned this whole thing around 
and he flipped it right back in their lap. And remember what happened, that Israel walked out of Egypt, they left with the spoil, because the Lord said, he said, you'll, you'll just basically pillage them, you'll take, and they'll freely give it to you, you'll go on your way, that you, you will collect the spoil on your way out. And this whole thing that Egypt wanted to do to them, God himself turned it right around. My hand shall destroy them, and uh, that word there, it means to dispossess them. And that's something else that is ironic when we talk about that, the word itself, destroy, this dispossession. They were going to, uh, again, destroy them because a lot of times we talk about what would go on if some uh, nation would come in and take over another, another nation. They would destroy them, but then the, they would dispossess them. They would remove them from their land. Uh, we see exactly when we talk about what God is doing now and what God will continue to do for them that as he faces these other nations, that they will go in and plunder and God will give them exactly what he said he would do with these other nations. That brings us to the, the next part where what God did or accomplished on their behalf. He's, he's, this is a summary, summarization of what God did on their behalf. You blew your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead in the mighty waters, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, faithful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them up. You and your mercy have led forth the people from whom you have redeemed. You guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. And this, again, it coincides with some of the things that we've already discussed. We talk about what, what God did on their behalf. Uh, but it notes one more time. And when it says that they uh, sank like lead, he says you blew your wind over them and you, they sank uh, literally, the Hebrew, it's, it's, they went gurgling down. That's exactly what happened. Uh, and we see when God's absolute power, that regardless of how large that army was, that God took care of them. And then he notes, he says, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Where did they just come from? They come from a, uh, a polytheistic uh, nation. They had a God for everything. And here that they're saying, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you? With all this that has gone on, with all the power that these supposed other gods uh, could display, who are they now? Who, as he says, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? I, that's that's yeah, hard because in in the knowing that is is God will continue to reveal Himself because we know that the world at, at one at a particular point in this juncture here for sure that there was, the world was filled with many gods but God would continue to self revelate He would show Himself that and they knew or should have known up to a point that yes God was looking at Him as the supreme God. But then you had all these other nations had their own gods, and um, what, what lost my train of thought. Um, and God Himself is, as we would see them looking, God. Oh, God Himself would self-revelate, and He would show them that all these other gods are nothing; they are the works of man's hands. Man will take silver or gold or wood or stone. Man will carve it out. He'll bow down to it. The Lord said uh, in uh, one of the major prophets, he said that they'll, they have eyes but cannot see, mouths cannot speak, ears cannot hear. He said this is just a working of So as God continued to reveal himself to show he was the only God, but man had made all these other gods, but for them, whether they thought that they were actually other deities or not, uh, probably did at one point, but as time, as God would reveal himself more and more, that there should have been a conclusion that there is only one God, just as stated here. Who, who is like you among the gods or the mighty ones is that, that also could be uh, translated. And he speaks about his mercy. Uh, he says, you and your mercy have led forth the people. Uh, your mercy here, and this is the word that is used many, many times over and over through the New Testament about the steadfast love of God, uh, God's unfailing attitude of his love towards his people. In your, in your steadfast love, in this mercy, you have 
uh, led forth your people that you have redeemed. You've redeemed this people. And in your mercy, this steadfast love of which you have something, it's a, a love that never fails. Uh, and we come into the New Testament with that understanding. We know that God himself, the Apostle Paul, would write about it, that there's a, there's a love that we have that God gives us through his son, Jesus Christ, that never fails us. And we can't even, as God continues to reveal himself, we can't even put a, a measure on it. We, we can't measure the love of God for us. There's no way that we can pull a line on that and say, you know, where does God's love end for me? What, you know, where, where does it stop? Where does it, you know, hold up at? But for us, we know it's, it's unfailing. And then uh, also he speaks about redeemed. Uh, and we know that that's a major theme, right? That's a major theme within uh, Exodus. We talk about redemption. Uh, the redeemed, as it says here, uh, you and your mercy have led them forth. You're the people whom you have redeemed. You've guided them in your strength, your holy habitation. Uh, redeemed, and God again is seen as the Goel, the redeemer kinsman of his covenant, covenant people. He is, he is viewed as they would come to see, as the Lord would start to lay out things for Moses and say, if this goes on, you'll have this kinsman redeemer, and he will be the one who's able to buy back the land, or if you sold yourself into slavery, buy you back. And then we look at like a book of Ruth, and we see the, the Boaz being that of, a, of the archetype of the one great uh, kinsman redeemer of the Lord, and he himself would purchase, and that's what we get down to, he purchased them, he bought them, he, he brought them out of their slavery. And lastly, we, we close here with, or not lastly, I should, we, we've got a few more, one other slide or two. Uh, the ongoing, uh, the ongoing effects. Uh, so they are looking, again, we teach, speak about, uh, they're praising God for all that he has accomplished for them at that particular moment, because that's what they're centered on. Egypt has been destroyed. God is an absolute power. There is none like him in, in all the world. This is, this is the one true God. And not only for that moment, but now looking ahead, and he says, the, the people, verse 14, the people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia, and the chiefs of Edom will de be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Cana will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them by the greatness of your arm. They will be as still as a stone. That, that's that basically when we speak about just dead. Mm -hmm. uh, still as a stone to your people pass over, O Lord, to the people pass over whom you have, what? Purchased, bought. Going back to that whole idea of redemption that he has bought them. So after God's mighty acts against Egypt, the surrounding nations would be in fear. They would hear of the mighty works of God at this particular occasion, what he did in Egypt, but this occasion uh, more directly, and they would be in fear of the Israelites. Joshua 2, if you uh, just keep your hand here in Exodus and turn to Joshua, and it's a verse that you are familiar with, I'm sure. But Joshua chapter 2, looking at verses 9 and 10, is... It would say, uh, verse 8, and he says, uh, Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said, And who is who are we talking about here? Who is the she? Rahab, Rahab sure. Um, and she said to the men, I know, I know, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are fainthearted because of you. For we have heard. So we have heard about what's going on. This, this particular incident that we're already, uh, already discussing and what is accomplished on Israel's, behalf, on Israel's behalf while they're praising the Lord. And he says, uh, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two other kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, uh, Shehan and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did they remain any more courage in any one because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. So not only was it for the Israelites to encourage their souls, hey, we're free, we're, man, what a great work of salvation that God had wrought for them at that particular moment. 
but it's going to have some trickle down again. It's going to be because from this point on, before this event occurs with uh, Rahab, how many years have passed? 40. Uh, 40, 40 years. 40 years. A lot went on in between, but God would still be faithful that as they would spoke that these other nations, that they would be in fear of you, but 40 years later, we would start to see that unfold. So, word got around. This group of a million some people who's been walking around in the wilderness out there traveling around Sinai and word got around what God did for them and now God instilled it in their hearts the fear the stories were told here's what's happened and now fear had uh, struck them and they were easily taken over as we know by the power of the Lord the end results and that's this is our last piece here you know, the last little bit uh, looking at verse uh, 17. He said, you will bring them in and plant them. Speaking about the, his chosen people, Israel. He says, in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which you, your hands, have established, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. So not only would there be some, again, some results that would uh, occur 40 years plus later, uh, we start to see eternally that they're not, not looking at their time here on earth, but they look at God as one who is reigning forever and ever, that God is looking to do much more with his chosen people than just uh, a Red Sea crossing or just the destruction of some other nations to give them this land he has promised them. But what God, what they are, the focus brings us back around. And again, this, this for a scripture looking extremely futuristically. Uh, a few things. He said that he will plant them. That God will do it. This will be God's doing. Uh, and we can't say enough about God's doing in our lives. What God is doing. Where he has, has put us and planted us and the things that God is doing. And when God does that, uh, then we can safely dwell and he says he's going to plant them on your mountain. Uh, the mountain there, when we literally, when we think about the mountain, we think about uh, that of Mount Zion, uh, where we, we see a lot of, and which is used most of the time in a poetic fashion, Mount Zion, speaking of Jerusalem. We speak about Jerusalem, uh, the Temple Mount, uh, that mountain, that place where God said, this is, this is my footstool. This is, this is the place I, for my name where it's going to dwell there at the temple that um, that Solomon would make for him and um, noted that this was where my name will be. And futuristically for these people, when we speak about the, the, the long run of things, and he says, you'll bring them, you'll plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made your own dwelling, the sanctuary. Uh, and keep in mind that they, they may have had in their minds uh, when they would sing this song over and over again at certain points, they may have had the mind, in the mind that uh, it may be not even so much so we speak about a sanctuary because there was not a particular sanctuary made for God. Now they would eventually have the tabernacle of meeting which would be begin with Moses and maybe that was kind of what they were saying. Well, eventually God's going to bring us, and this will be the place, especially when you can come down upon that tent. But uh, knowing that there would be a, a, a sanctuary established that God himself would establish. And that carries us a little bit further. So we can look at the tabernacle of meeting. We can look at the, so the temple that Solomon built. And then we can look at the... Um, once that was destroyed, we see Nehemiah and Ezra coming in, and they rebuild it. And we have the with the Herodian dynasty and, and Herod rebuilding. And, and now when they talk about the temple, we rebuilt again uh, in Israel. But this is saying here when he says this, this sanctuary, which you, which your hands, which you have made, your own dwelling, your hands have established it. And that, that carries us uh, further down the road when we think of God's ultimate promise to Israel. And we know that God had made covenant after covenant with, with individuals, starting with Adam and Eve and right on up to the new covenant we have today with Christ. But knowing that God himself will, will return ultimately, and he will reign, just as noted, for forever and ever. 
And that's where we go one more time back to Revelation. Uh, we speak about the ultimate result of which we have. Um, Revelation chapter 11, um, looking at verses 15, 16, and 17. Chapter 11, verses 15, 16, and 17. Um, here we have uh, the Bible says the, the seventh angel sounded, the, the seventh trumpet sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, the, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And Gene, this is the other part we talk about, the hallelujah chorus here. Uh, the kingdoms of this world, so when they were speaking in a, maybe more of a, in a microscopic view when they talked about Moab and these other places that would be taken over that God would give them. But now we're speaking about God himself that all the world is his, all the nations of the world. The kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And this is the 24 elders who sat before God on the thrones fell down on their faces, faces and worshiped God saying, so we've got the worship of, of these people, the song of Moses, the song the Israelites sang for their great deliverance that God worked in their lives that day. And now we have futuristically, when we look ahead to, to our day with the Lord, when we are able to get before God and his throne. And it tells us here that the elders worship God with their faces down. And he says, we give, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead and they and that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven. And the ark of the covenant was seen in the temple and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings and earthquake and great hail. Just a picture now. We talk about those as we just kind of look at the, some of the similarities and not the, to belabor it, but knowing that all praise is always given to God. Then, now, and in the future. Always knowing, as it said here, the one who was, who is, was, and what it is to come. Uh, your power is great, as we've already talked about. Nations may have been angry. They may have gotten upset. Egypt was upset because Pharaoh knew that this was of the Lord. He acknowledged this was of God. He said, go out and worship God. His nations were angry, and we've got nations today, as we see, they've become more, uh, in our own time, uh, more anti-God, anti-Christ. It was uh, at a point, you know, where just people just got upset at the name of Christ, but now there's even this thing about just God himself. Just get rid of God and the Lord. We see that God hasn't changed. God judged Egypt that day. And God has noted here that he will come, the time of the dead, and that they should be judged. And with that judgment, there is also a reward. There's rewards with those who have been faithful. It's the prophets and, and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great. So the judgment upon the Egyptians and see that day the reward for Israel that she was saved and, and now they were set free from that tyranny for us the day we were saved and God set us free our enemy himself that we know death, hell, Satan all those things have been judged on our behalf and we celebrate just like we see here as God himself as he notes and should destroy those who destroy and should destroy those who destroy the earth, uh, knowing that ultimately we look at the enemy, uh, looking to do all that he can do to uh, wreak havoc uh, in our lives, but knowing that uh, our focus is on the Lord. And uh, just like Miss Bess has said, we, we can find ourselves at points being kind of, of fickle. Uh, one day we're up, one day we're down, born again believers in Jesus Christ we, we want to be steady knowing that every day won't be a good day and every day won't be a bad day
but we're just steady regardless, always looking to praise, honor, exalt, mm -hmm. worshiping the Lord, knowing who he is, knowing what he's done, and knowing that he will pay back the enemies, but he will reward all the faithful. Mm -hmm. What a good God. Mm -hmm. you know, wonderful Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, she was talking about the fruitfulness of man. That's part of our fallen nature. Mm -hmm. But then in verse 13, he talked about, I said, you know, the, the work or faithful lovingness of God, he never changes. Yeah, that's exactly right. We do. You know, we are a constant flow and changing and different things, and we're never constant. Right. Because we're fickle because of our fallen nature. nature. Mm -hmm. And we won't have that until, you know, we are completed in heaven. Heaven. And, uh, but he is. It's a great message for young people, you know, because they're looking for the world's consistency mm -hmm. and the world is fickle. Yeah, yeah. And it flows you know, like, like, like the tide. It's the one that ultimately will love you forever. Sure. And ever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. and, ever and ever. And ever. I was, I was, that's in, just, yeah. it was a wonderful thing. I was impressed Sunday night service with you when you were talking about praying to God and how he always hears us. Always hears us. And it doesn't remind how you can answer me that. Yeah. It, it was so comforting to think about that, that no matter what we say, what I say, when I pray, he, he, always, he's, he hears. always, always hears. That's so it is. It's a real comforting thought. Yeah. And, uh, and I think in uh, with that in mind and, and just knowing the awesomeness of God and, and I, I, I think back on on times like that when uh, you know I've been in situations where, where someone has died and I've been with the family and, and and it's not so much that that they remember anything that I ever said but they they knew that I was near yeah. uh, they knew I was I was there and, and for, for me, I can remember people that, you know, in, in situations in my life, I remember when I was down, and I don't remember a whole lot about what people said, uh, but I do remember they were there to, to hear me, to be the ear. I knew they were there. And that's the same thing with, with, with it just, it just, it's actually, it just uh, rises above what anything we can do humanly. Uh, but God, on that same note, he's just always there. Yeah. He's always listening. Uh, not that we may, and, and sometimes we might be praying and really not asking for nothing, no. but just uh, but like, like we used the phrase, bend his ear. Bend his ear. Lord, here's what's going on, and you know, I don't know what to do, and it's just da 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 da. And but but knowing and having that understanding, and that's something that we, as we said, that sometimes we feel like our prayers hit the wall and our ceiling and bounce back down. But that may that may be how we feel. But God says in his word that he always hears. That's, again, like John is saying, that's just the consistency of God. God is just always, always that way. Anything else? Anybody got anything else? 